Andréa Puig Hilde, ¿eh? Dear friend, buongiorno. Good morning in US and South America. Good afternoon in Europe. Uh, good night in China. Uh, we will uh, end week six with the bank. And uh, you saw uh, the program of week seven this coming week. Also, as I promised, I am presenting you the program of the final week, week eight. So let me briefly share the screen. Week eight is going to be the last, uh, the last uh, week and is going from May 18 to May 21st. Topic will be ethics, uh, uh, sleep apnea and temporal mandibular disorders. And the speakers will be Peter Greco on Monday, Amayo Hall from England uh, on Tuesday, Ambro Michelotti and Jacopo Cioffi from uh, Naples and Toronto. And the final uh, lecture will be Martin Palomo. So ethics will be the topic of Peter Greco. Then Professor Ama Johal, Dental Sleep Medicine. Beyond teeth, uh, what do we know about pain and dysfunction? Ambra Michelotti. University of Naples, Federico II, and Jacopo Cioffi from Toronto. And then the final lecture is sleep apnea and the orthodontist. So uh, I want to remind you to use the question and answer button to facilitate the work of the moderators. And if you have any question that you particularly like, you can use a like button to emphasize the question. And without any further ado, I hand over the floor to Anne to introduce today's speaker and moderators. Anne? Thank you. Well, welcome. Happy Thursday. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mohammed Masood. He completed his orthodontic specialty and training and earned his doctorate at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. He uh, received the Joseph Henry Award at the School for Clinical and Research Excellence and he also was awarded the Harry Sitter Award from the uh, American Association of Orthodontists. Dr. Masood is a diplomat of the American Board and has served as an examiner for the board. In addition to uh, practicing in private practice for over 13 years, he was the clinic director, the orthodontic clinic director at uh, the Boston University Henry Goldman School of Dental Medicine, and he is currently the director of the orthodontic program at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. Uh, Mohammed holds three patents, and he's published over 20 papers that he has presented nationally and internationally. Uh, Mohammed is uh, uh, very well known and has done a lot of research in uh, growth and uh, is going to talk today on considerations and management of class two patients. We have moderating for us today from the Angle Society of Europe, Patricia Olbach, and we have moderating for Angle East, David Musich. Uh, without further ado, Mohammed, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. It's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be uh, introduced by one of my uh, faculty, and I really appreciate that. And um, I want to thank um, uh, everyone that's been involved in uh, organizing this meeting. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can see okay. it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to thank uh, Renato, uh, Uta, and everyone involved in this. Um, it's, it's, it's greatly appreciated, and it's a huge service for the community. Um, so today I'm going to talk about considerations in the management of class 2 patients. And um, I modified it a little bit based on uh, what was covered the last few days um, to kind of uh, try to tie it all up and um, tie it all together. Uh, so I'm going to cover these considerations, and it's a clinical presentation. So I'm going to show some cases. Um, I'll show a little bit of research, but it'll mostly be cases to kind of give examples um, of these considerations. So we'll start out what, with growth and preventing dental compensation and how they relate to each other. Um, so I'll start out here with the, uh, with the Cochrane Review. So 
The Cochrane Review that, that Dr. O'Brien is involved in, it has two parts to it. And the first part gets covered a lot. The second part doesn't seem to get enough attention, or I think it's actually the more interesting part. Um, the first part covers the um, early treatment and, and all those studies, and it's nice when you see different researchers reaching the same conclusion. All the studies consistently show that there's no real advantage to treating class two patients early. Um, this, these studies were never designed to show whether or not functional appliances or headgears work. They were designed to see whether there is a, a benefit to treating early versus treating late. And that's why there was no untreated control. The patients that served as an untreated control for the first phase, all of them got treatment in the second phase. And that second phase of treatment often involved headgears, uh, extractions, rubber bands, and sometimes even functional appliances in the second phase. So I think they're, they're, they're great studies at, at, um, at looking at the question they were designed to evaluate, which is whether or not there's an advantage to early treatment. The second part of the Cochrane Review looks at studies that, um, that treated using functional appliances during the growth spurt. And that shows a slightly different picture. Um, there are two randomized controlled clinical trials that looked at treating during the growth spurt. And both of them showed that there was a skeletal advantage to treating during the growth spurt. So most of you are familiar with the forest plot and, and, and you, can, you can see that this is looking, this is comparing inter, uh, functional appliances uh, early versus late. Um, and there was a, a difference after the first phase uh, but when you follow them up to after the, the control group got their second phase of treatment, that, this, that, that skeletal difference um, was no longer statistically significant. But when you look at the studies that looked at treating during the growth spurt, um, both of them, randomized clinical trials, showed that there was a skeletal advantage to treating during the growth spurt. And since that Cochrane review, there is a systematic review and meta-analysis that found, came to similar conclusions. The first group of studies all looked at treating early, and they all came to the same conclusion. And the second group of studies showed that when you treat late, um, you, you do have uh, a skeletal advantage. And this looks at mandibular length. And there was a, a relatively recent study after, that came out after the Cochrane review, Martina et al., um, when she looked at mandibular uh, and she looked at mandibular length changes, um, comparing uh, functional appliances to untreated controls, and there was a statistically significant difference in mandibular length, in mandibular change, mandibular length change, as well as ramus, ramus height change. Um, other factors related to growth that that I look at are, are based on uh, Frankie and Bichetti study looking at uh, the gonial angle, and when the gonial angle is below 125, that usually indicates the patient's going to be a good responder. And you want to start during the growth spurt. I think a hand wrist radiograph is more accurate than a cervical vertebra. I, I want to start when the sesamoid uh, appears and the patient's just starting capping. And <clears throat> this study looked at other, you know, fact cephalometric. Uh, measurements like the mandibular plane and they, they, there was no, they weren't predictive of who was going to respond well and who wasn't. Another thing that I look at on SF and, and I couldn't find any studies that uh, this is just my observation is that when the chin uh, leans forward, when you have a forward extending chin, um, it, the, those patients seem to respond a lot better to growth modification. Um, the only thing I could find about that was uh, Ramzi Haddad and Joe Ghaffari's study, um, and they, they called it chin extension of the cervical uh, mental angle, mental cervical angle. And they found that the more acute that angle, that that angle was predictive of, uh, um, of the patient's skeletal pattern. Um, and it, it makes sense. The more, the more acute that angle, the more forward leaning the chin, um, the patients seem to respond better to functional appliances. So I'll go through my um, decision-making process 
regarding which, um, how I'm managing a class two patient. Um, so this is Sarah. She's got uh, a moderate amount of upper and lower crowding. She's full class two, um, definitely mandibular retrusive. Uh, I like her nasolabial angle. I don't want to change that much. A pretty significant skeletal class two. She's got that forward leaning chin. Second molars are developing. And I'm, I'm getting a good vibe from her about her cooperation. Uh, parents have got good control over the situation. They, she's motivated. If I've got all those, and she's, she's, um, uh, I, she's, she's at the beginning of her growth spurt, I'm, I'm leaning towards using a, a twin block. I'm, I'm, that's the appliance I'm most comfortable with and I think I can get the nicest response with. The thing is, there's, there are different ways to use a functional appliance and I think it makes a big difference regarding what kind of outcome you get. Um, most textbooks um, will tell you to adjust the functional uh, when you're taking the bite registration, to take the bite registration um, at an edge-to-edge -edge relationship, or sometimes even beyond an edge-to-edge -edge relationship. The problem with that is that there's nothing holding those lower incisors back. And, you know, what's going to move faster, lower incisors coming forward or the patient growing? And, and growth is a much slower process than, than proclining lower incisors. Um, and I think if you're going to use a functional appliance like that, then maybe what Dr. Secchi mentioned a couple of days ago is true, and, and you're going to end up with mostly uh, dental changes. And maybe if you're using the functional appliance that way, maybe it's not much different than using class 2 elastics. But I think if you control the lower incisor inclination, uh, like Mauro was mentioning yesterday, if you control the lower incisor inclination, you get to keep the functional appliance in for longer. Uh, you get to, to prevent that dental, you're treating it like a surgical case. So my goal is to procline the upper incisors, attempt to retrocline the lower incisors, and then use a functional. It's not the quicker way to do it. You definitely finish much, much faster if you take your bite registration at edge to edge or beyond, but you don't get the same outcome. Um, one of our part-time faculty, Todd Rowe, always uh, says orthodontics is like making souffle. It's not scrambled eggs. And I think that's, that's, that's the difference here. Um, you, can, you, can, you can take your bite registration at edge to edge or beyond. You'll be done with the functional appliance in six to eight months because the overjet's gone. And you're not going to keep them into, in the appliance until they've got an anterior cross bite. So you end up taking it out. And the condo... Uh, the condyle is designed to get the teeth into maximum intercuspation. If the teeth are locked in and you've got overjet and contact between the upper and lower teeth, there's no reason for it to adapt anymore. So uh, I, I take my bite registration with the upper and lower incisors in contact. And if I'm proclining those lower incisors, I keep modifying my functional appliance to maintain contact between the upper and lower incisors. And I'm going to show you cases where the lower incisors retrocline. You could, you could do it using a TAD, but I think in a lot of cases where the geometry is right and the occlusal plane is in the right direction, if you get the lower incisors to contact the upper incisors, you can get them to retrocline without using a TAD. It's the same, it's the same concept. So here you can see we've got a two by four. Um, we're we're, um, we're uh, aligning the upper teeth. We're giving her more overjet. And you can see here um, we've, we've trimmed the, this is without the twin block, obviously. Every visit we check for centric relation um, and we measure maximum protrusion. So um, what maximum protrusion tells you, it's an indication with, before you take your progress stuff, it's an indication of whether the patient's posturing or whether the patient's growing. If the patient started out with an eight millimeter overjet and a maximum protrusion of minus two, and uh, you know, three, four months later, the overjet is down from seven or eight to, to four, but maximum protrusion is still minus two, then they haven't really grown. Um, 
if the overjet goes from from eight or seven to, to three or four, but maximum protrusion goes to minus four, or minus five, that is 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 an indication that's, that she is responding to the functional client. So the posterior open bite's always nice to see. And once uh, I, I get the AP correction that I want, I start trimming the twin block to allow the molars, the lower molars to erupt to make up for the ramus height, the, the change in ramus height. So I want the molars to uh, interdigitate in class one to help maintain that change. And she's got some crowding. Uh, she had some IPR. We, we, uh, we limited the amount of proclination, but the proclination that occurred there is the result of relieving the crowding. It gets upper and lower fixed retainers. I'll show you superimposition. This is a year uh, retention. And she grows a lot. Um, and I think in, in patients where the, um, it's the right time and you get the right cooperation and they've got the, 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 the right anatomy, I think these appliances can be a, a really useful tool. Now, if, uh, if the patient's towards the end of their growth or, or the, 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 the child's talking to their mom, back at their mom a lot, or they see a lot of tension between the parents and the child, the parents aren't in control of the situation, or I'm worried about growth being close to being done, and I don't want to waste time, um, I'll, I'll, use a, I'll use a fixed functional appliance. I don't think they work as well. Um, but if I, if I don't want to risk losing that uh, opportunity, um, I'm, using, uh, I'm using a fixed functional appliance. So this is Audrey, and she's towards the end of her growth. If you look at her cervical vertebra, she's, she's, she, you, you could consider her finished, but we, we thought we'd give it a try, and we, we tell these patients, you know, we're going to do our best, and, and in, in my personal experience, I think eight, nine times out of ten, it works out great. Um, but if the cooperation's not there, or if the response isn't there, then we're, we tell them that, you know, they might end up with needing to have a discussion about either upper premolar extractions or, or jaw surgery. And here's her hand wrist radiograph. We, we, we were hoping to, to see that she still had a significant amount of growth. Her sesamoid's there. You can see capping, and she's starting a few. So we're thinking she's towards the end of her growth. She might have a little bit left, but not much. And that's why we didn't want to risk any compliance. So we just had her posture forward just to kind of get a feel for, just like in a surgical patient. I'll often, whether it's a class two patient that's getting growth modification or if it's a surgical patient, I'm, I'm having the patient posture forward just to get a feel for what the, 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 how the lips are gonna drape in that position. And you're also looking at the transverse. Uh, because most of these patients, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use a functional appliance, you need to expand the maxilla to adapt um, to uh, accommodate that wider part of the mandible. So she, uh, she gets a herpst, and we're constantly maintaining contact between those upper and lower incisors. And you can see how those lower incisors start to retrofine. So I'll show you this, Seth. And that's kind of where she starts. And every visit, we check to make sure we've got contact, and she'll get deeper and deeper as you advance with the, with the herpst or mar or whatever you're using as a fixed functional. The more you advance, the more if you maintain contact between the upper and lower incisors, um, you can get those lower incisors to retrofy. If you take your bite registration at edge to edge, there's nothing holding those lower incisors. They're going to come forward, and that's going to happen faster than the patient can grow. So we end up putting some bite turbo so she won't put it, bite the brackets off. Um, and um, we bond the upper and lower arches. And that's where she finishes. In retrospect, maybe she could have used a little bit more uprighting of the lower molars, a little bit more expansion. Third molars are still developing. And she gets a pretty nice response, even though it was, it was later in her development. And you can see the, the blue, is, the black is initial, blue is progress, red is, is final. You can see between black and blue, those lower incisors actually uprighted. 
as we were advancing and maintaining contact between the upper and lower incisors. They obviously came forward because she had crowding, she had that curve of speed. And if the compliance isn't there and the patient can't tolerate a functional appliance, we're taking out upper premolars. This is a patient that was referred to me from teaching practice at Harvard, and she had started treatment in the, with, uh, in the, in the teaching practice with uh, a fixed functional Amara, um, and the patient couldn't tolerate it, and mom was making a big deal. Um, she ended up seeing me in the faculty practice. I told them I would have done the exact same thing that the, that the, that the part-time faculty had done. Um, but if she wanted me to treat her at this point, I was extracting upper premolars. I wasn't going to waste my time any more time on something that she, she showed that she couldn't really tolerate. So we extracted upper premolars. So this is, sorry, this is, um, this, I took the appliances off, took some new initial records, still pretty much almost full cusp class two. And we extract upper premolars and she finishes, she finishes nicely. I think in these, in, in these upper premolar extraction cases, to get them looking good, you really need a lot of torque on those upper incisors. So I usually use Warren springs uh, for the majority of treatment. I've got partially activated Warren springs to maintain the torque of the upper incisors. The last thing you want on these patients is to just move the upper teeth, tip the upper teeth back to the lower. Um, they just have that upper by extraction look. Um, maintaining upper incisor torque is really important to get these cases looking nice with upper premolar extractions. And you can see here, her upper incisor inclination is maintained. And she didn't grow much, even though you know, she, she was at her growth spurt and she didn't grow as much as I was hoping she'd grow. Crowding is an, another important consideration because uh, it, it can prevent you from being able to control that lower incisor position um, during, during, during your growth modification stage. And I'm going to cover this with a story about two sisters here. And they're actually more than sisters. They're twins um, that were treated in the clinic. Each one of them was with a different resident, but they had pretty much the same treatment protocol. Um, but there was a difference. Um, one of them would not let us extract teeth. And the mom stood by her, and I, I wish we hadn't budged. Um, the second one was a couple of months behind her in treatment, and she let us take teeth out. So it's not often that you get identical twins with, um, with, with uh, where, you can, where you can treat them differently. But this is one of those cases. So Camille, um, sorry for the photo, her head's a little bit tipped down there, but she's, uh, she has a, a facial asymmetry. Her chin is a little bit to the right. It's interesting that her sister's chin is to the left. Her chin's to the right. Um, Full cusp class two on the left, half to three quarters cusp class two on the right. And she's got a significant amount of upper and lower crowding. Um, wisdom teeth are, are uh, obviously don't have room, second molars are erupting. She's, she's hyperdivergent. Um, Lower incisors are at 90 degrees. They actually look pretty good, but she has a significant amount of crowding. So we told them we'll, we'll start out with, with some growth modification, but that growth, but we, we said that that growth modification is something we're doing to allow us to extract upper and lower premolars. So the, the goal was to get her to a point where the class two correction was achieved through growth modification, which would allow us to extract upper and lower premolars so we can get the incisors at a nicer inclination and reduce some of that lip strain that she had. Um, if, if, I, if I don't correct the class two relationship with a functional appliance, then I'm locked into extracting upper buys and ending up with lower incisors that are proclined and, and a chin lip relationship that's not ideal. So she gets a Mara, and she gets some expansion. You can see we're, we're trying our best to maintain contact between the upper and lower teeth, but it's not always possible. If the occlusal plane uh, and the 
depth of the bite aren't favorable, it's going to be very difficult to maintain contact between the upper and lower incisors, especially on these hyperdivergent patients. And this is one of those cases where I, I, I wish we had used a TAD like, like Mauro uh, had mentioned yesterday. Anyway, at this point, we're talking to them about extractions. And mom is, I don't know if she had a bad day, but her and the daughter were completely against it and they would not let us. And, and at that point, we're already in treatment, but they completely refused taking teeth out. And um, yeah, I wish we had stuck to our guns because this is one that didn't turn out very nicely. And I think it's related to those lower incisors coming forward and getting her lower incisor, there's no room for those lower incisors. There's so much crowding in the lower um, that they have to come forward. We IPR, couldn't IPR enough to eliminate the crowding um, and maintain a good lower incisor inclination for her divergency. So she ends up rotating down and back and we're changing, chasing the mandible backwards. And you can see there her, her her, uh, her vertical wasn't maintained well, her lower incisors came forward. I don't like the lip strain that she's got. And the lower incisors didn't procline that much with the amount of IPR that we did. They're at 96 to IMPA, but they're pretty proclined for her divergency and for her face. And that's where she ends up. And, and I'm honestly not happy with her, with the way she looks. She finishes quicker than her sister, but I think her sister finishes better. So her sister on the other, uh, so this was as we we're um, finishing and detailing, and that's her, the day of debond. You can see the tissues are a little bit inflamed from the debond. The models look okay, but I'm not happy with her face. I'm not happy with that lip strain. And she ends up at 102 which is more than I'd like to be for her divergency. Now her sister on the other hand starts out the exact same way. She, her, um, her asymmetry is to the opposite side. Her mandibles off to the left and lower midlines off to the left. Um, both sides are a little bit more class two than her twin. And, uh, but Sarah lets us extract upper and lower premolars. So we're using the functional, and then about two-thirds of the way, we extract upper and lower premolars, and that gives us the room to upright those lower incisors. And she finished, she's still hyperdivergent, but we get a, a lot more chin projection. Um, and part of that chin projection is, uh, is some better uh, vertical control, better... Um, she expresses some more growth in the anterior, and when the lower incisors are uprighted, it gives us better definition of the chin. And there are the two sisters, um, and you can see there's there the there there's definitely a difference in the in their profile and their vertical control with um, with the different treatment approaches. Um, the next issue we were kind of torn on, uh, and I'll show you a couple of cases that kind of um, got us thinking about this when we're treating class two patients. And I'll also talk about some um, unpublished work that we're, the, that, that we're submitting for publication right now. So I'll start with this girl. Um, she started out full cusp class two, completely blocked out upper canines. Uh, she has a lingual arch, she has some mild crowding in the lower, but she also has a family history of sleep apnea. Mom has sleep apnea. Um, we, we, we did a pediatric sleep questionnaire group of questions and a, a, lot of them, um, a lot of them were answered positive. So we were concerned about sleep apnea. I also think she has a, uh, a nose that's not done growing. Um, obtuse nasolabial angle. So I wanted to give her uh, some additional lip support. Um, and that was a time where, you know, we were getting, uh, there was a lot of accusation being thrown around by the general dentist that orthodontists are causing sleep apnea. And, um, and we, found, we, we came across this study by Peter Nan that talked, showed how functional appliances 
uh, can help patients that actually have sleep apnea. It can improve their AHI. And there's also this study that showed that if you extract upper premolars and do nothing, this, this study basically just took upper premolars out, followed the patients up for a year with no intervention, compared them to a matched group that had no upper premolar extractions. And uh, they found that the, uh, the patients that had upper premolar extractions um, had less uh, growth of the mandible and less counterclockwise rotation tendency for the mandible, um, which I thought was interesting. So that kind of got us thinking, both the profile concerns and the sleep apnea concerns got us thinking of trying to treat her non-extraction in the upper, uh, advancing those upper incisors, giving her a bit more lip support, and then using a functional appliance. Um, um, around the same time, uh, one of our residents, uh, Shema Tabari, um, was working on a research project that, um, that looked at um, predictors of sleep apnea. So, and, and we also wanted to see what, whether or not there was a relationship between orthodontic tooth movement and sleep apnea. So what we did is um, for, for a few months, everyone that started treatment got a sleep study. Um, and we worked with Elliot Katz from Children's Hospital. He's a, he's a pediatric, and, uh, pediatric pulmonologist and he read all of our sleep studies. Um, and the idea was we, we included everyone. It wasn't just extraction patients. We also included non-extraction patients. The, the thought being, if, 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 there, if the hypothesis is that retracting the upper teeth um, causes you know, sleep apnea or, or airway obstruction, then the opposite should be true as well. If you're moving the teeth forward, then you, you should have the opposite effect. So we just, this was a fishing expedition to, to decide what to focus on in future research. So we started out, anyone starting treatment before they started, they got a sleep study. Um, and we were looking, we were trying to see whether or not there are any predictors of, of a high AHI. And um, we actually found quite a few. Um, maxillary arch length was a big one. Maxillary inner canine distance was a, was a big one. Uh, uh, max, uh, inner canine distance, um, SNB, the lower SNB was the higher the AHI was. And there have been other studies that showed similar things. Um, and uh, the pediatric sleep questionnaire was predictive of sleep apnea and, um, and, uh, and airway length. Um, so we followed these patients up during treatment and she tried as much as possible to, to, to include all of them in the follow-up. Um, You'd think you'd offer uh, patients like a free sleep study, they'd be all over it, but it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of them had, had sleep studies where they, where they didn't have enough hours to get a, a proper uh, assessment of their sleep. A lot of them refused to do it again. They said they couldn't sleep properly with, with, the, um, with, the, with the monitor. Um, so we ended up with a much smaller sample size for the, uh, for the follow-up. And here we looked at um, different cephalometric parameters. We looked at different model parameters. Um, and, the, um, and we actually looked at AHI. A lot of this, the, the reason we were doing this is that a lot of the studies that look at extraction uh, effects on, on, on airway, they're looking at the airway size. And the airway is not diagnostic of sleep apnea. You need a polysomnograph to diagnose sleep apnea. And um, uh, there's the relationship between airway size, whether it's on a pan, whether it's on a CEPH or a CBCT is, is definitely weak. It's, it, it, there is a relationship, but it's not a strong relationship. So when we followed these patients up, we, the only factors that we found that that changed during orthodontic treatment that were that correlated with a uh, worsening AHI or sleep apnea score were um, 
were, were maxillary arch length, so the distance between the molars and the incisors. When that distance between the molars and incisors increased, the AHI decreased. When that distance between the incisal edge and the first molars decreased, the AHI increased. Um, and in, in the inner canine distance had a similar, the low mandibular inner canine distance had a similar relationship with, um, with the AHI. I was honestly going into the study being sure that we weren't going to find anything. And I would have been happy, you know, publishing that. Um, I was pretty sure we were going to go in there, look at all these measurements, and there wasn't going to be any relationship with between changes in any tooth movements and, and change in AHI score. I was, I was actually surprised that it was upper arch length on the models that was the only factor that was correlated. And, and we corrected for, uh, we controlled for uh, age, gender, BMI, and it was a pretty significant relationship between upper arch length and the AHI score. Changes in upper arch length and change in AHI score over time. Uh, this was not a homogenous sample. This, this was a fishing expedition to decide what to focus future research on. And, and um, we're, we're, uh, we'll, I'll talk to you in a, bit, a little bit about what we're doing now about this. So back, back to our patient. Um, second premolars are ready to erupt, and you can see those canines, upper canines have nowhere to go. You can see that obtuse nasolabial angle, that nose, and she's at the beginning of her growth spurt, and you know that nose is going to grow more. She doesn't have a favorable... Um, chin um, anatomy. Lower incisors are at 96, so I, I really don't want to see them come much, come forward much, if any, if I have a choice. And um, so we decide to open spaces, advance the upper incisors, basically decompensate her, advance the upper incisors, make room for those canines to come in, give her a bit more lip support, and then use a functional appliance to get her lower uh, um, arch to catch up with her upper. And then once we have enough uh, clearance, we, we use Amara, and again, we, we maintain contact between the upper and lower incisors to limit the proclination of those lower incisors. And she's in the Amara for close to a year. She obviously gets some expansion. And then we bond the upper and lower arches at this point. Canines are starting to erupt. They weren't exposed. Lower incisor here at the end of the, this is, this is the day she was bonded, right at the end of the functional appliance phase. And the lower incisors are 95 degrees. I can't get that if I'm using rubber bands to correct the class two relationship. I'm getting retroclination of the upper incisors and proclination of the lower incisors. I have no way to control that with, with rubber bands. And I, I don't get the vertical control that I can get um, with the functional appliances. And that's why I think you get a, a better outcome with this way of treating the patient. And she gets a decent amount of growth. You see her nose grows, but her nasolabial angle looks is looking better. Here we're you know, getting on the canines and finishing and detailing. And that's her finish. It's a fixed retainer in the lower. And I like her nasal labial angle. I think I think had I think she has a better outcome than she would have had if we had extracted upper premolars. Um, we don't have um, you know an alternate universe where we can compare, but um, but. Um, I think her nasolabial angle turned out nicely. Um, lower incisor ended up at 95 degrees. Now this patient got me reconsidering my, um, my position on the whole upper premolar extraction situation. Um, he has an older brother that's on a CPAP. He has, his dad is on a CPAP. Um, during the consult, he was there, his dad, they were, uh, I wanted to do pretty much the same thing we did for the previous patient, uh, advance the upper teeth. He has retro, uh, obtuse nasolabial angle. 
canines blocked out, retroclined upper incisors, there's plenty of room to advance those upper teeth. Um, and we agreed that we were going to do pretty much the same thing that we had done for the previous patient, open spaces, and we were going to actually use a twin block uh, once we had uh, clearance and had advanced the upper incisors. Um, after we agreed on everything, next time the patient comes in, mom's there, and she says, extracted, he's getting upper premolars extracted, and there's no reasoning with her. Um, I told her I, I think I'd prefer to procline the upper teeth and set him up for jaw surgery, and she was not having it. There's no surgery. There's no growth modification. Mom decided he was getting upper premolars extracted, and I think at that point, I, uh, I maybe I shouldn't have, but I learned something from giving in to her, and you'll see how the case turns out, because I was pleasantly surprised. So we took out upper premolars. The kid was a champ, finished treatment in well under two years. And um, this is the day of debond. What really surprised me is that he grew. His nasally, we, and again, upper premolar extraction cases almost all get Warren Springs with me. So he had Warren Springs for, for the majority of treatment to control the torque of those upper incisors. But he grew, and during treatment, I didn't really need to use any class two elastics. Um, nasolabial angle looks nicer, and he grew a lot. And I was pleasantly surprised. You see, I had to, to, I ended up advancing the upper teeth, even though I extracted upper premolars. He was growing, and I just keep, kept torquing those upper incisors. And, and, and that got me wondering, got me looking at my class two cases a little bit more carefully. And it also got me um, to work with another resident, uh, Shira Gendelman, on, this is his, uh, his retention, these are his retention records. But we worked with Ashira Gendelman on um, going back and looking at our upper, at upper premolar extraction cases and comparing them to our functional cases um, and looking at their airway and look, airways and looking at the skeletal change that occurs during treatment. And I also started looking a little bit more carefully at my upper premolar extraction cases. And again, this is, this is uh, pure opinion slash observation. I think once you start taking those upper canines back and on your upper premolar extraction cases, I think you start to develop, you, you get inclined planes where the patient starts posturing forward. I, I look for it and I see a CRCO shift on these patients as you start to retract the upper canines. So maybe that's what's causing um, an improvement in the skeletal relationship. And this is different than the study that just took out upper premolars and did nothing. So this is upper premolars with intervention, where you start retracting the canines and bringing them into class one. And I think once those upper canines start to come back, it, it's a little bit like what you see with a headgear. I don't know if, if people that have used a headgear have looked at this, but when I use a headgear, a couple of months into the headgear, you get a, a pretty significant improvement, but you take them back into CR and, and they're not there. They're, 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 the cusps, when the patient's transitioning from a full cusp class two to a class one, you get you get a period where they start to develop a functional shift, those inclined planes, get the mandible to posture forward a little bit. And I think that's why patients on headgears do have a little bit more growth than untreated controls. Um, so in this study, we looked at upper premolar extractions compared to functional appliances. We did an airway analysis and um, we also did a cephalometric analysis comparing mandibular length, ramus height, A and B changes. Um, all the skeletal measurements improved a little bit more on the functional appliance patients, but it wasn't statistically significant. The thing that was statistically significant was superior airway space and retropalatal airway space. Everything else was a little bit better on the functional group, uh, patients in the functional group, but it was not statistically significant. Uh, the difference was not statistically significant. Up superior airway space and retropalatal space was. 
And the reason we wanted to look at this was, you know, Shema's study, where we just looked at everything, all the types of movements we did in the clinic, we thought what cases have a change to the maxillary arch length more than upper premolars, uh, upper premolar extractions on patients with an excessive overjet. So that's kind of what Ashira focused on. Patients that had excessive overjet, class two, and had upper premolars extracted um, compared to functional appliance treatment. And she, she, she matched the cases pretty well, um, age, uh, gender, and, and growth status, and so on. And this was interesting. All the airway measurements had, were better in the functional group, but these two measurements were statistically significantly better. So maybe the growth advantage isn't as big as I thought it would have been comparing functionals, I thought you'd extract up, and I don't do upper buys a lot on on growing kids. It's 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 my last resort when uh, when I use all the other tools and the patient refuses jaw surgery. That's when upper buys come out. Um, but maybe I was too hard on upper premolar extractions because the you do you can get if, if you I think if you control the upper incisor inclination well. And um, and you manage the vertical well. I think I think you can still get a significant amount of mandibular growth on these patients. Um, the last patient I'm going to talk about is, and the last consideration I'm going to talk about is kind of relevant to um, this time that we're in: um, patient availability or doctor availability. Um, so this is. Uh, a patient, Selena, who um, she was 11 years, seven months old. Primary concern was that that uh, upper canine that's blocked out. No significant medical history. History of trauma to her upper incisors, and that's related to the next issue, which is she lives on a 50-foot aluminum boat. Her parents are explorers, um, in a global global climate expedition, and um, they told me that, you know, she spends most of her time, you know, crossing the Atlantic or the Pacific, and I'm not going to be able to see her more than twice a year. There, there's one year where I might have seen her three times, but that was it. And that affects what you can do. You don't want her having emergencies in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So that's their boat in the Arctic. She's in the mic, uh, late mixed dentition. Uh, second premolars are developing. She's getting close to losing those E's. Second molars are quote, close to developing, quote, close to erupting. You can see she has a very sensitive profile. Um, retroclined upper and lower teeth. Uh, normodivergent, very favorable um, chin uh, anatomy. So retrusive upper and lower lips, retrusive chin. Both midlines are off to the right. The uh, right ca upper canine is more blocked out. She has a she has a blocked out lower right uh, premolar, and that's why her lower incisors are off to the lower midlines off to the right. Mandibular hypoplasia. She has a short lower face height. She's not. She's not that hypodivergent, but she does have a short lower face height class two molars and canines. She has an impinging deep bite, uh, retroclined upper and lower incisors and severe upper and lower crowding. And she's got undersized upper lateral incisors. So we have our work cut out for us, especially that she's telling us that we can't see her regularly. Now in a normal situation, I'd be opening, I'd have a two by four, open spaces for those canines to come in, give her a little bit more, give her more upper lip support, open room for that lower right premolar and, and, and go for some growth modification. I think she's lost a little bit of space on the right side. Um, I'd be considering distalizing on the right side um, as well. But that, all of that's off the table 
because I don't want her with a broken distalizer or a broken two by four. Uh, um, I guess we've all gotten a little bit better at managing these emergencies from home and having Zoom, you know, HIPAA compliant Zoom meetings with the patient. But this was before then, and uh, I now know that I can do a lot more remotely than I ever thought that I could do. But this patient was before that era, and this was my first experience with remote care. So we end up choosing to do it with clear aligners. And she signed every, I got her on the consent form. We added so many clauses to the consent form saying, this is going to be an improvement. Um, I, I treat a lot of patients with aligners. We do surgical patients with aligners. But this was out of my aligner, way, way out of my aligner comfort zone. But I also thought that, you know, she... She's a really compliant girl. She's a really sweet girl. I, th I thought that we could at least try our best to give her an improvement, um, at least try to get those canines in. I told them we'll shoot for ideal, but I seriously doubt we're going to be able to get uh, anywhere near an optimal result if, if our hands are tied this way and, and we're only using clear aligners. So I asked for um, distillization of the molars on the right side. Uh, 20 degrees, 2 to 3 millimeters, as well as some derotation of the upper right molars. I wanted class 2 elastics from the upper right canine. I thought she was very lucky in that way. I thought she was lucky because the lower right premolar is, let me just put this one. the lower right second premolar is blocked out lingually, and the upper right canine is blocked out buccally. And I thought that was very convenient. So I wanted her to wear rubber bands from the upper right canine to support that molar distalization and to wear the rubber bands to the lingual of that lower second premolar so that as we're opening spaces, that lower second premolar can move labially. Um, this, the, this clincher, uh, these the, these groups of clincheks took a, a lot of work. It, 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 and I'll show you the process of dealing with the technicians because they did not get what we were trying to do. And I asked for the upper and lower midlines to be moved to the patient's left as we advance the upper and lower incisors. And I asked for virtual bite turbos. I wanted virtual bite turbos that were that were. Um, changing as the patient's teeth advanced because I wanted to use that kind of like a functional appliance where I was asking the patient to posture in that position with, with contact between the upper and lower teeth, but I wanted to give her a platform to bite on. So this is the first clinch check they sent. And, and you can see here, I, I, that tooth was there. I scanned it. But on the first clinch check, they just omitted that lower left second premolar. If you go with the first clin check they give you, this is not fitting. This aligner will never fit. The other thing they did is, is they omitted this canine. It's there, but they got rid of it. And uh, again, if you go with this, uh, probably around the liner 10 or 15, uh, it's, the aligners will stop fitting. And on the left side, they give you this massive tooth that doesn't really I mean, it gives the tooth room to erupt, but it doesn't, it, you can do better. And they finally gave me the tooth, but then as they get it to erupt, you have to pay attention with these um, growing patients or patients with teeth that are erupting. I want you to notice the neck of this tooth. As the tooth erupts, it gets skinnier. So right about halfway through treatment, these aligners will stop fitting um, because we all know that the uninterrupted part of these canines is much wider than, than what we see. Um, and the technicians just don't get it. You tell them every, you try all sorts of ways to ask them to make the tooth get bigger as it erupts and they say it's not possible. The only workaround that I've found is asking them to bring the gums down with the tooth. So tell them to assume this is the tooth and then as it comes down, just bring the gums with it and don't try to erupt it because they can't, they're, they, their algorithms can't predict the uninterrupted part of the tooth accurately. 
here we're at plan seven and I'm pulling my hair out because they, 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 uh, they give me a pontic in that area. They're not giving me the real tooth um, and they're making room for it, but it's still not what I'm asking for because I can't use a rubber band for that. They end up giving me the tooth, but they wouldn't give me a, class, uh, a, a cutout for a rubber band. Uh, they said the clinical crown was too short, so they couldn't give a cutout for a rubber band to be worn. The work around that ended up being asking them to forget about the cutout, just make, give me the tooth, show me the scan part of the tooth, but make the clinical crown shorter, bring the gums up, and that's something they can do. So they can assume that the clinical crown ends here and assume this is gums. And what that does, it, it gives me this part of the tooth, the lingual cusp, for me to bond the button to and have her wear an elastic for that. So this was plan eight, and this is the one that we kind of we ended up ended up going with. We're advancing the lower incisors, swinging the lower midline to the face left, distalizing in the upper, doing some sequential distalization in the upper, making room for those upper canines for to come in. And she comes back about nine months later. And this is where she's at. She's lost her baby teeth. Um, she's got some improvement. That lower second premolar is in. Uh, the canines are in the arch. She's still about half cusp class two on the right side, maybe a quarter cusp class two on the left. And she's on a liner 41 of 54, and we decide to do a refinement at that point. The goals of the refinement were um, a little bit more distillization. The upper incisors were tipped to her right, and we wanted to upright them. And we wanted to refine some spaces for the upper incisor buildups. She also had a, a chip, a fracture of her upper teeth that, that happened on a, on a stormy day on the boat, and she, she had chipped her tooth a while back. So we, we, we wanted to do a little bit of composite work on, on those upper incisors. So she had a couple of months of nothing, and they, they flew her in from Iceland to start the refinement. Um, so between September and November, nothing really happened. This is her after the first refinement. She's starting to look a little bit better. Canines are class one, midlines are a little bit closer, still has the tip issue with those upper incisors, lower crowding's pretty much gone. And uh, at this point, I build up her upper laterals for her and we scan again for another refinement. I don't think there's, I can't think of a patient we've treated that didn't need a refinement. Every patient, every Invisalign patient needs a refinement. Um, if you're going to finish them nicely, they need at least one refinement, usually multiple refinements. And we decided to take our final records early, even though we, were, we had scanned for a refinement. I wanted to see what the roots were doing. I wanted to kind of evaluate the changes that were occurring. She was, a, she was a good grower. We lucked out with that. Um, upper incisor inclination actually looks pretty good. Invisalign sometimes struggles with that, but if you're proclining, uh, it's, it's better at proclining than torquing. Um, the lower incisor is advanced, but her face could take it. Her chin could take it. She has a long nose and a long chin, so, and she's not hyperdivergent, and she could tolerate that, uh, the advancement of those lower incisors. And this was the, and at this point, we're at plan number 18. So these patients might take less work from you in the clinic, but it definitely is a lot more work in front of, a lot more time in front of the computer. Um, and I was FaceTiming with her regularly, um, especially during the first round of the liners. In the second round, it was just, uh, there was less rubber bands being used and less craziness going on. It was just finishing and detailing at this point. So we were trying to get the gingival margins uh, a little bit nicer. We wanted to get the second molars, uh, the torque on the second molars looking a little bit better. We wanted to get some better interdigitation. So this was the approved second refinement. We tried our best to over-treat those upper central incisors. 
And this is where she finishes. And she finished with an, a result that was better than, than I had expected. Um, the conclusions are functional appliances are, are, are tools and you could use them or misuse them. Um, and I think it's a tool that we should all have in our toolbox because there are patients that can benefit from them. Um, I think preventing dental compensation, treating these functional cases like surgical cases, controlling as much as possible the lower incisor inclination. Um, uh, um, like Mauro was saying yesterday, a tad's a great idea for that. Sometimes you need to take teeth out to be able to control that lower incisor inclination. But it, it, I think it's key to getting a nice response with growth modification. It's the same idea that the Tweed people had with, with uh, headgears and class three elastics to upright those lower incisors. I think it, I think it makes a big difference. Uh, vertical control and treating during the growth spurt. I think those are all factors that help you maximize the skeletal effect that you get during treatment. Um, decreasing maxillary arch length might have a negative effect on the airways. We, we're, we're in the process of starting a longitudinal study now, um, taking actual AHI, uh, like doing actual sleep studies at the beginning of treatment and taking them uh, again at the end of functional appliance treatment versus upper premolar extractions. And um, you know, based on our previous findings, we need to try to answer that question a little bit better. And finally, clear aligners can be useful in treating situations where patients cannot be regularly seen in person. And I want to thank um, uh, the organizers once again for the invitation, and I want to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Well, uh, can you see me, um, Renato? I'm not sure. Yes, uh, we can. Okay. You, and if you don't mind, we, uh, if Andrea is available, we can run the poll. It's just oh, yes. for okay. two minutes. So I will ask the cooperation of the postgraduate students to improve our initiative. So uh, we would ask, are you planning to follow the webinars from week seven and eight? So please answer. The second question is, how do you judge the selected topics of the webinars? I leave you a few, few seconds to decide. And then the third question is, how do you rate the discussion afterwards so that we can evaluate if we want to change the model of these webinars? And finally, would you consider to follow some selected angle webinars during the rest of the year? In a scale one to four, what would be your intention in that respect? So after leaving the students the time to answer, I will hand the floor to uh, the moderators to start the discussion. Thank you very much. Please. Okay. First, thank you so much, Dr. Massoud, for this brilliant presentation lecture. And we know that this topic of class two treatment is always really interesting regarding the number of participants we have and regarding the questions we have. Uh, many topics um, we have to discuss on. Uh, the first one is regarding um, um, the registration of uh, the bite uh, when you are uh, making impressions for uh, functional appliance. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so... Um, I give the patient a mirror. Uh, if the upper and lower midlines are coincident with the patient's facial midlines, yeah. um, I have the I, sh I show them where their upper midline and the lower midline is, and I ask them to posture with positive overjet overbite. I, I kind of sh show them where I want them to be with my hands. I want the midlines mm -hmm. on, and I want the upper and lower teeth touching each other, but with overlap between the upper and lower incisors. And uh, you're going to drive your lab person a little bit crazy in the beginning until they know how you like your functional appliances made because they're not used to it. They're used to making your functional appliances with these big massive blocks that are, make it very difficult for the patients to wear regularly. 
um, and they're used to making them edge to edge or at an anterior cross spike. Um, but I'm asking the patient to posture with the upper and lower teeth touching each other and the midlines on. And I give them a mirror and I have them practice it a few times. Uh, and then I fill the sides with, um, with blue mousse if I'm taking a traditional impression or I'll scan. And now we'll just have them posture in that position. Um, give them a mirror, ask them to hold it. When I can see that they can hold it for long enough, I'm going in there and scanning on both sides um, or just filling it with, with blue mousse. Um, yeah, that's, okay, that's right. that. And then as, as the teeth change during treatment, you need to constantly modify the slope on the bite block. I modify the lower bite block slope and just add extra composite to the lower to maintain that contact between the upper and lower teeth if I'm proclining the upper teeth. Okay, and you mentioned that if you are maintaining the contact between the upper and the lower incisor, you will not have proclination of the lower incisors. It, de it depends on, on the patient's geometry. You can't always maintain. There's some patients that are very steep or they don't have enough overbite for you to be able to, when you advance them, you can't get that. But for the majority of patients, you can. And if you can maintain that contact, you'll often see the lower incisors. Instead of procline the way you'd normally see, you actually see them retroclining. Okay. And just to add a question, uh, are you using the same protocol for MARA? Or is yeah, it just I mean, for functional, uh, for bite block, twin block? Uh, so the same, same, exact same concept if I'm using a MAR or if I'm using a Herbst, I'm using the exact okay. same concept, okay. Um, okay. adding shims to it to just to keep that contact between the upper and lower teeth. Okay, I'm pleased to hand over to you, David. Well, thank you. <laughs> we have uh, a number of, I'm going to pick the first question that seems to be of interest to many of our attendees. Could you elaborate more on why you think uh, removable functional appliances work better in your hands than the uh, fixed functional appliances? Is this sort of an evidence-based concept, or is it just uh, operator bias that may come into play with this choice? Um, so I, I yeah, comment. Um, I think it's a combination of operator bias and 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 just personal observation. I I I, I don't have any a study to, to prove that it works better but I, I tend to see um, more dental movement I think with the with a herbst or a Mara you tend to see the molars slip forward or tip forward you don't see that as much with um, with a, with a, with a twin block because that that lower arch length is locked so I think you see less um, developing of that curve of speed and less tipping of those lower molars if, if you're using if you're using a, a twin block and um, and this is just personal bias and observation is is um, I can keep the twin block in for longer and, I, and to me the longer I can keep the appliance in for the less dental compensation that's happening and I'm hoping I'm getting more skeletal change and the, just again, this is just pure observation. They seem to look nicer at the end with a, with a twin block than with a fixed functional appliance. And that's just my personal observation. This, this kind of follows, I'll just do a follow-up if that's all right. Uh, the, Patricia, I have a, a follow-up that goes with the requester wondering whether you feel mm -hmm. like you are actually with your uh, functional appliances stimulating mandibular growth uh, versus the evidence that we've talked about earlier in the week with Dr. O'Brien that um, that we don't have studies that really or evidence that really shows that there is a growth changes in the mandible that the mandible doesn't really change in its size with the studies do you do you feel like you're getting actual so, change in mandibular dimension so all the studies that looked at early treatment consistently showed that there's no advantage over treating late. But those studies, again, they were never designed to show whether or not these appliances work compared to untreated controls. I think that table that I, that, uh, that uh, forest plot that I showed for the, uh, for treatment during the adolescent growth spurt compared to untreated controls, that's from Kevin O'Brien's Cochrane Review. It's there. Uh, if you look at the Cochrane Review, that table's there. It just doesn't, never gets mentioned for some reason. And it's, um, 
that is the best evidence that we have for treating during the growth spurt. There are three randomized clinical trials that all show exactly the same thing, that if you treat during the growth spurt, there is, it's not a, a huge change, but there is a statistically significant improve, uh, ch uh, improvement to the skeletal relationship. Um, I also think uh, most of those studies were not, you know, um, taking a, we're taking a traditional bite registration. So I think that, I think you can, I think you can do, you can get more than that. But, but even in those randomized clinical trials, which is the best evidence we've got, all of the ones that looked at treating there, I couldn't find a single randomized controlled clinical trial that treated during the growth spurt that showed that there was no difference compared to untreated controls. Um, the, the, the other part of that is, I mean, why do we, why do we treat I mean, uh, a, 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 a patient that has a lateral shift early? Um, and there's, there's plenty of research that shows that the condyle adapts over time. If a patient has a lateral shift um, for an extended period of time, they develop asymmetries. The condyle does adapt to get the patient to intercuspate. There's obviously limits. The patient's genetics have a, a will, will put a limit how much you know growth potential the patient has. But I think if the patient's in their growth spurt, you can. There's a range of of and there there are epigenetic factors that can determine whether or not the patient reaches their full potential. And there are things that we can do to, to control the vertical dimension, to create an environment that helps the patient reach their, their genetic potential of how much that mandible can go. Obviously, there are some patients that need jaw surgery because their jaws are so small and they don't have the, um, the potential to, to fully correct uh, like a, a, dis a significant discrepancy. But I think the majority of our class two patients, there are a lot of there are a lot more patients that get sent to surgery than necessary. I think um, it, that's a great. I think it's a great answer uh, yeah. for the many residents that are listening in on the, the program to try and understand that controversy. And I think uh, that was a very very good answer, Mo. Uh, w one last thing is um, there's a researcher named Dan Lieberman. Um, he's at the Peabody Museum. He he, uh, he's an anthropologist, human anthrop uh, he's a uh, um, physical anthropologist, and he publishes in Science and Nature and stuff like that, so we probably, he doesn't publish in orthodontic journals, but some of his papers actually have CEPHs, and he, he has a really interesting study that kind of highlights these epigenetic factors that influence um, mandibular growth. He takes pigs, and he gives them fresh fruit, and takes another group of pigs and gives them fruit that was put in the microwave. And these are all siblings, like uh, pigs that are that are that are litter mates. And um, and the patients that are the, the patients, the pigs that are on um, that are on microwaved fruit had mandibles that were 10% shorter than the ones that had fresh fruit. So that shows that there are epigenetic factors that do influence the expression of, of, uh, of uh, an individual's growth potential. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now we can go a little bit faster because we have a lot of questions to answer. Um, uh, it's regarding um, the, the treatment with um, four by extractions. Um, would you consider doing the four by extractions before using the MARA? While you are not leveling and aligning before using MARA? So, I, I try not to. There are, there are exceptions, but I try not to bond the lower arch because once you bond the lower arch, even if there's a little bit of crowding, those lower teeth are going forward. So I want to not bond the lower arch, and that allows me not to have to deal with issues like tooth size discrepancy. If I bond the upper and lower arches, I'm having to deal with whatever tooth size discrepancy the patient has. Those lower incisors are coming forward with the night tie wires. It makes it a lot harder to prevent dental compensation. If those lower teeth are crowded and I'm using the appliance to try to retrocline the lower teeth, I don't care if they get more crowded. If they get more crowded, I'll take teeth out later on. I don't have a problem with that. But I want to retrocline 
the lower teeth as much as possible. Let them crowd uh, because I want to maximize the time that I can keep them in a functional appliance and try my best to maximize the skeletal response. Yes. Okay, here's a, a question that uh, several people had. Um, first, I thank you for your lecture. Why wasn't the MARA used from the beginning in the case with the upper threes impacted? Wouldn't the headgear effect have helped the distalization of the upper first up, upper molars? Uh, is, are they referring to the last case, or no. the, or the 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 one with the with the bilateral the girl with the bilateral intacted canines? Yes, that one. Um, so I didn't use the Mara from the beginning because there was no room to advance her, and I didn't want to take her beyond edge to edge. So okay. I wanted to maintain the contact because she, she's starting out at 96 degrees with an IMPA of 96 degrees. If I, if I put the, her at edge to edge, lower incisors are going forward. So I created an environment where, um, A, the canines could come in, and, and B, um, I could start using Amara and maintain contact between the upper and lower incisors. And to be honest, the coil did cause a little bit of derotation and distalization of the molars. You can actually see the molar relationship getting a little bit better even before we put the MARA in because of the, that open coil. And in that same type of case, just to follow up, in that same type of case where there's a third molars developing nicely, would you ever consider extracting upper second molars to facilitate the uh, headgear yes. effect of so, the MARA on the first molars? Have you done that and found that to be an effective uh, strategy? I think it makes sense. Uh, I know people that do that. Um, I haven't had the guts to do it. Uh, it's nothing wrong with it. I just, I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it, but, but I, it makes perfect sense. And upper third molars, unlike lower third molars, upper third molars, they come in pretty reliably. Uh, I just haven't done it, but I agree it makes sense. I'm more likely to extract upper wisdom teeth on, on, on someone a little bit older and, and distalize, but up, extracting upper second molars does make sense. I just have them. Thank you. Yes, um, I have a question from um, a professor in France, in Marseille, who is Michel Legal, and he asked, um, the case with no space for the upper bicuspids, why you don't extract the second bicuspids? You're not used to extract the second bicuspids, maybe. Um, no, I don't have a problem extracting second. I think and there's some situations where I'll intentionally extract the second bicuspid and put open coil to help uh, make room for the canine and distalize the first. If I'm extracting upper premolars and the canine's blocked out, uh, I'll often extract the second premolars rather than the first bicuspids because I like the anatomy on the first uh, premolars. Uh, it, it allows me to retract the upper first premolar without taxing my molar anchorage. I, I actually do that a lot. It's just that on that case, I wanted to advance the upper incisors. I didn't want to correct the class two relationship um, with, upper, with upper extractions. I wanted to get as much proclination of the upper teeth and as much advancement as I could um, of the lower arch. But yeah, if I'm extracting upper buys and the canines are blocked out, I'll often extract second premolars. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. This, uh, this question also shows uh, a lot of interest, and it, it, it's related to long-term stability. According yep. to a few studies, long-term class two correction does not seem to stay stable. What is your opinion, and do you use different mechanisms to stabilize the class two correction in high angle cases versus low angle cases? Perhaps in a low angle case, you'd use an anterior bite plane as part of your uh, armamentarium and in a high angle case maybe a full coverage a splint is, is that part of the uh, goal and, and do you agree about the stability issue um i spend a lot of time a lot of time checking cr and and when i was starting out uh, i had a lot of inference from paul regali and and i, I uh, for a period uh, i actually would take uh, take away the lower component of the functional appliance and leave the upper component as a splint. So if it was like an acrylic splint herbst or a twin block, uh, I would keep the upper occlusal coverage and get rid of the lower and let them go for a visit with no lower component um, just to see whether or not they drop back or how much they drop back. Um, 
I think if you're careful, and, and it's, the same goes for a headgear or forces or rubber bands, you really have to look for, for, for CR. And there are patients where, you know, you're close to the end of treatment and you really look for CR and you see like a two millimeter CR CO shift and you end up having to put a forces in or something just to, to get rid of that CR CO shift. And we all, we've all been there. Um, I think if you're careful at looking, at looking for CR, I think they're pretty stable. Uh, I think, you know, everyone has, you know, a case that they remember where they came back and they were like, you know, they dropped back to two millimeters uh, class two or a quarter class, class two. I don't think it happens often, but once in a while you get those, but I don't think they happen any more frequently than they do with any type of treatment type as long as you're checking for CR. Um, I don't use a, a, a functional appliance in retention. Um, if the patient started out shallow, I might use a full cover. I might use an SX retainer. If they started out open or started out shallow, I might use SX retainers just to kind of keep, keep them deep in the front. Um, I personally, unless they started extremely deep, I don't often use an anterior bite plate long-term for retention. Um, I don't like the effect that you get long term where the molars erupt and they kind of rotate down and back on you. I want to try to get forward rotation on most class two patients. But yeah, once in a while, I mean, I've used an anterior bite plate for retention, but very seldom. Thank you. Um, now we have questions for with your uh, the, the research you have done, you are doing for uh, sleep apnea treatment. Uh, during the study for the sleep apnea, did you measure the, the AHI before and after the treatment and compare? Yeah, so, so the longitudinal study that we did, that we just did for every patient that was getting treatment, we were taking AHI before and we were taking AHI after. And that's, 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 uh, that, that's, uh, that paper is, is being reviewed right now. The, the, um, it's... Um, Yeah, so we did AHI before and after. The, that longitudinal study that we did was not looking at air. We did measure airway, but we, we, the, the primary outcome we were focusing on was the AHI. And it did um, get a little bit worse when the maxillary arch length decreased. I, I was, again, I, was, I wasn't expecting that. Um, in, in this research, did you compare um, the, um, the skeletal discrepancy, skeletal vertical discrepancy with your, um, um, with, with the patients? Did you compare it or not? Yes, we, we did. And we, when we looked at it cross-sectionally, there was something there. So when we looked at it cross-sectionally at the beginning of treatment, the patients that were more class two had higher AHIs. Yeah. But when we followed them up over time, the change in the skeletal relationship, we, again, and this is our sample, and it, this, was, this was a fishing expedition to, to kind of decide what to focus on after that. But we, we, we didn't notice in our sample, it doesn't mean that it's not there. We might not have changed the skeletal relationship enough on enough of those patients to find statistical significance. It doesn't mean that it's, there, there's no relationship. But we couldn't, in our sample, find a relationship between the change in the skeletal relationship and a change in the AHI. David? We probably didn't have enough patients where we changed the skeletal relationship. That's my guess. This yeah, is a thank you. Probably, I, I see Renato on, and, and I don't yes, know. Yes, Renato is here. <laughs> the hammer, the last question, but uh, ties in with ties in with the. Uh, AHI, the, the measurement, there's a couple of questions about how did you measure that arch length and is arch length, a, in your opinion, a more significant factor than, say, expansion, maxillary skeletal expansion when it comes to reducing the risk of uh, AHI increasing? I thought, I thought that we would find the relationship with intermolar distance. So, you know, that, that's what I was expecting. We just looked, again, we, we did it, this was just a kind of a preliminary pilot study to, to see if we could find something to focus on. And the upper arch length was the one that, what, that we detected in that sample. Very interesting. Renato, I turn it over to you. you. Renato, I have just a comment from a, a, a participant. May I, may I, may I, just a small, small, small time, really. 
thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question. If we will be able to get the recording of the webinars, which we are not able, we are not able to watch. Uh, that, that is a, a very good question. I, I, uh, I had this type of emails all the time. And I want to make clear, uh, as a platform, for GDPR reason, we cannot keep recordings. Therefore, we cannot send recordings. But we send the link to every speaker so that the following day he can download his own or her own presentation. So the request should be made directly to the speaker, not to us, because we cannot keep a recording. Maybe in the future we will, but not at this point. So we, as the platform and the initiative, we do not have the, the recording of all the speakers, but all the speakers will have the possibility to download uh, the recording, so you can ask them. And the, record, the recording will be canceled from the Zoom platform after 24 hours, because otherwise we would need the permission of all the patients and it would be very complicated according to the EU GDPR. Okay, thank you for the participant. Okay, well then, uh, it has been a great uh, week. So I hand the floor over to uh, Anne, but before I want to remind you that at seven o'clock PM, uh, Central Eastern uh, European time, we have to the, tonight the webinar that I organ we organize with the European and American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. And uh, Greg Kinzer, great prosthodontist from Seattle, will give the lecture tonight. Do not miss it. It's, it's going to be a great presentation. Anne, please. Thank you, Renata. And uh, thank you, Patricia and uh, David for a uh, job well done moderating. Lots of nice, interesting questions. And Mo, thank you very much for your presentation. So we, we so closed much. the door on, on class twos for the week. And uh, we're going to turn our attention towards uh, craniofacial growth, some cleft lip and palate, some eruption disturbances, and uh, auto transplantation. On Monday, we've got Dr. Pierre Rank talking to us about normal and abnormal dental facial growth. And then on Tuesday, we take a trip to Denmark to uh, spend some time with Dr. Bechtor, and she's going to talk to us about disturbed tooth eruption. From there, on Wednesday, we get to go to my hometown, Boston, uh, with Dr. Carol Ann Trotman, and uh, to Chapel Hill, North Carolina with Dr. Timothy Turvey, an oral surgeon. And the two of them will talk to us about facial uh, cleft and craniofacial update on orthodontics and surgery. And then lastly, on Thursday, we uh, are going to go to Poland uh, with Dr. Uh, Zakroska, I hope I said that right, <laughs> with autotransplantation <laughs> of developing premolars to the anterior maxilla in orthodontic perspective. So next week should be a very interesting and varied week. I want to wish uh, those mothers in the group an early happy Mother's Day on Sunday. And uh, everyone have a great weekend and stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Arrivederci. Hello. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Renato. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, 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 David. Thanks, David, for sharing this. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.